I want to welcome you back to our seminar on Living to See Jesus, a final generation for this 1888 conference. And welcome to each of our viewers. And I invite you to join with me once more as we pray and we invite God's Spirit. Father in heaven, thank you for <clears throat> this opportunity to come consider where you would have us be in this time, in this earth's history, how you would have us live. Please, Father, truly draw our hearts closer to Jesus, that we might truly long to be one of that final group of people that live to see Jesus come. In his name, amen. In our last seminar, we talked a lot about the kind of background and issues concerned with this thinking of Jesus coming in a final generation. We realized that there's a lot of tension over this concept of a final generation and what is the theology behind it. Just briefly in terms of summary, um, clear things that I think most everybody can agree with is that Jesus is coming and we again hope that would be very soon. Since Jesus is going to come, that necessitates that there will be a final generation. And also, this might be one of those controverted points, but that there needs to be a special work of character change for those that will live to see Jesus. Through this time, Christ's ministry in the sanctuary of heaven is the center. And of course, it's important for us when I say that to also underscore it with that in the heavenly sanctuary, Christ uses his sacrifice as the foundation for his intercession. So as Ellen White makes a point in the book Great Controversy, through Christ's ministry in the sanctuary above, Calvary is immortalized, that the death of Christ on the cross is reflected in the imagery in the sanctuary. And ultimately, this battle needs to come to an end. The Great Controversy needs to be concluded. We're each one looking forward to that event. I also mentioned that some of my conversation part partners for this are these two books, George Knight's End Time Events in the Last Generation, and a book, by written, a book written by a number of scholars, predominantly from Andrew, called God's Character and the Last Generation. And both of these books critique what's come to be called Last Generation Theology. And in our previous um, study together, I highlighted four main authors, E.J. Wagner, M.L. Andreessen, um, Herbert Douglas, and Mervyn Maxwell as people that particularly come under fire in this book, God's Character and the Last Generation, as well as in George Knight's book. And so we began to look at really what some of the things these people taught and are the accus accusations or the statements made about their teaching really accurate. So a couple of the key concerns of the writers of this book is that somehow God's people can contribute to God's vindication. And we'll look at that more in detail during this time together. And then there's this concern about absolute perfection and absolute sinlessness. So it's interesting that I don't know anybody that uses those expressions on the, certainly not Wagner or Andreasen or Douglas or Maxwell, they never use these expressions, absolute sinlessness or absolute perfection. And so kind of a question as to where does that phrase come from? Another concern of the writers is this belief that Jesus must be, quote, exactly like us, close quote. And you hear that refrain repeated frequently throughout the book, that the people that believe in last generation theology or great controversy theme, as Douglas would say, underscore that Jesus must be exactly like us, like us. And they are their concern also, excuse me, their concern also is that overcoming is meritorious. In, in other words, overcoming has merit or value to it. As we said in the previous presentation, there is a connection and interweaving between our eschatology and our soteriology in how we view final events unfolding and what we think about the plan of salvation. These are not two separate disparate concepts, but they're interwoven. So um, I want to just point out this idea, it's brought out in logic frequently, it's called a straw man fallacy or argument, 
And the idea of a straw man fallacy is when you take an opponent's argument and you either overstate it or misrepresent it in order that you can more easily attack it or refute it. So you take something that might have a kernel of truth to it, but then you overstate it or misrepresent it, and then you can refute it. So from my viewpoint, the accusations of those that wrote God's character that there is this absolute perfection and absolute sinlessness and that Christ must be exactly like us, these are really straw men argument. Because I don't, um, you know, I looked clearly through the writings of Maxwell Douglas, Andreas, and, and Wagner, and really don't find those statements being expressed. I did mention in the last presentation that there are other people who are often connected with last generation theology, um, the writings of Wieland and Short, or the teaching of Dennis Preeby, or Larry Kirkpatrick, or Kenneth, Kenneth Paulson, Kevin Paulson. Um, and, you know, I'm not speaking for them. They're still alive and they're still communicating and writing. But I haven't found in, in my study, and I might be wrong, but I haven't found those writers either using these expressions, absolute perfection, absolute sinlessness, um, Jesus must be exactly like us. So this seems to be a straw man. And as I did a review of the book, God's Character, um, I, you know, really and went through the footnotes and tried to find supporting argumentation for this and really found it lacking. One of my concerns with the book as a whole. So, but let's begin to explore this concept for this concern on the humanity of Christ. And this idea that last generation theology individuals teach that Jesus must be exactly like this. Well, this is kind of a partial truth and a partial error. So let's explore it together. And in order to do that, I'd like to frame the conversation in a few key questions. So clearly the foundation question for us is, what kind of man did God become? When God stepped into humanity, when eternity stepped into time, what kind of humanity did God become at that point in history? Um, and the way the conversation is usually framed is in a polarity, like Adam before the fall or like Adam after the fall. So this is kind of a base question here. But another question for us to consider is, what is the purpose for the incarnation? In other words, why does God become man? That's a foundational question as well. Another question for us is, well, how long does God remain man? How long does the incarnation last? So in order to begin to dig around on the first question, what kind of man did God become? there are a few passages of scripture that are important for us to consider. And those individuals that critique last generation theology will focus on these set of task texts. And, and these are wonderful, beautiful, valid Bible verses that need to be taken into account by any Bible student. Uh, so um, you know, I do a lot of leadership coaching and in organizations, there's also oftentimes what we find, what we call a polarity. Sometimes in theology, we might call it a tension or, you know, kind of a paradox where you have these biblical tensions. So God is sovereign and yet we have free will. And where we lean to one pole or the other helps really form our theology. So these verses need to be taken into account when we think of the humanity of Christ. So what are some of these passages Tell us. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 indicates very clearly that Christ, that he, that is he, speaking about God, made him, speaking about Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So it's really, really clear here that in the incarnation we can see that Christ knew no sin. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7 describes Christ in his work as a high priest. And it says that he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. So those verses give us a clear understanding that Jesus is, is, has uncertainly some aspects that are unique to him because he's sinless, he's holy, he's undefiled. And let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Luke. 
Luke chapter 1, in verse 35. Luke 1, verse 35, where we find this passage. This is Mary speaking with the angel about the announcement that she's about to give birth. She responds in, responds in verse 40, 34, How can this be? And then in verse 35, The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Or some translations say, that holy thing. The holy thing begotten is what the Greek really says here. So the Holy Spirit is involved in Christ's birth very clearly. And because of this, he is called that holy child, that holy thing, and will be called the Son of God. So in the incarnation of Christ, you see the work of the Holy Spirit in the birth of Christ. Clearly, Mary has not had sexual relationships with a man. She becomes pregnant. This is a miraculous event, work of the Holy Spirit. And yet, as it says in the King James, that holy thing will be called the Son of God. So this is the, those, these are some of those texts that emphasize one side of Jesus in the Incarnation, and we could call it his uniqueness in relation to the Incarnation. None of us have come into the world the way Christ did. None of us have chosen to come into the world before we were born. And so there's a pre-incarnate volitional act in relation to Christ, where Christ chooses to come into this world. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, as it says in the Psalms and quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. So in a very different aspect, a unique aspect on the Incarnation. But what does this mean? How do we apply it? I mentioned in our previous seminar that the, from Catholicism, the viewpoint from Catholicism is that Mary, in her birth, was protected from the ongoing impact of sin, and that's what the Immaculate Conception is. The Protestant view is slightly different, and that is that in the Incarnation, when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary here and the power of the Most High overshadowed you, that something was done in the Incarnation to protect Christ from the impact or the results of sin. So those raise a lot of questions, but one thing we can agree on, I believe most of us can agree on, is that there is a unique aspect to the life of Christ, that he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, he's never sinned, he had the work of the Holy Spirit be from his birth, he had a pre-incarnate volitional act where he chose to come into this world, and he was clearly without sin. So a couple of really helpful passages here from the writings of Ellen White. This is, uh, you can find it in the Bible Commentary, page 904, where she writes, put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground, quoting, obviously, Moses' experience at the burning bush. Then she applies it to this, to our study. We must come to the study of this subject with the humility of a learner and with a contrite heart. The study of the incarnation is a fruit, incarnation of Christ, is a fruitful field and will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. So here we find this balance. There's a tremendous blessing to be found in studying the Incarnation, in working through the Incarnation, yet you and I need great humility. We need to come to this topic as a learner, thinking through clearly what is God trying to tell us. And unfortunately, a lot of our conversations on this topic have generated more heat than they have light, because precisely because of this lack of humility, this lack of what does the scripture say? How can I really lay aside my presuppositions, very hard for us, we all come with our presuppositions. But again, it's very important, particularly in the scholarly, the academic world, to recognize what your presuppositions are and you know, lay those out there so people know where you're coming from. So again, um, come as a humility. Now again, come with humility, with the spirit of a learner. From the youth instructor, <clears throat> from September 8, 1898, 
Ellen White said this about Christ, No one looking upon the childlike countenance, shining with animation, could say that Christ was just like other children. So if you saw the little Christ as a child, you wouldn't say he's just like other children. Why not? Because he was God in human flesh. When urged by his companions to do wrong, divinity flashed through humanity and he refused decidedly. So a lot of thoughts there as well. Some of the key thoughts for us to take away for this study is that we, would, we must realize that Jesus is not just like other children. And if somebody is arguing that Christ is just like us, then that argument needs to be reframed. But if that's simply a straw man argument and there's really no evidence for people saying he's just like us, then we need to reframe our critique of the talk. Now Knight, in his book, um, The End Time and the Last Generation, you know, he brings out how Jones, A.T. Jones, partner with E.J. Wagner, made very strong statements about Christ being like us. But in the next sermon that Jones gave, this was in 1895 at the General Conference Session, General Conference Bulletin, 1895, Jones makes a clear distinction. He says, no, he's not exactly like us. He's got this unfallen mind. A, um, he, he's different than us. He's distinct than us. So Jones himself recognizes the identity where Christ is like us, but he also recognizes the uniqueness. And by the way, those phrases, identity, uniqueness, I'm drawing from Woodrow Witten's book, uh, Ellen White on the Humanity of Christ. We'll talk more about that as we go through this. So again, this quotation continues, the same one I just read. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. Then this quotation, we should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Now, in our last presentation, I shared with you that you should Google this, no misgivings. I'm going to put the illustration up on the slide in a moment that you can see um, how this quotation is being taken out of context. But first, let's look at it here. Again, she's saying that Christ took upon man's nature, how? In its fallen condition. But he did not in the least participate in its sin. So somehow in the incarnation, it's possible for Christ to take man's nature in its fallen condition. And I do not believe that here she's simply saying he got tired, hungry, and thirsty. Because in Desire of Ages, she talks about the human race decreasing in moral worth when Christ came into the world. And that Jesus took all those effects upon it. So she's painting a picture larger than simply the physical degeneration of the human race. But Christ took the human nature in its fallen condition, but did not participate in sin in the least. And then this quote, no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Now this doesn't look the best, uh, my apologies, but on the top, this is a screenshot from uh, searching the phrase, no misgivings, and you can see point number seven, perfect sinlessness of Christ's human nature. So this is the way it kind of looks in the Bible commentary and in the book Questions on Doctrine. There are these headings, perfect sinlessness of Christ's human nature. And then you have this quote, we should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. And it sounds like the heading matches up. The screenshot below is the fuller quotation. It was given originally in Youth Instructor. Here it's quoted from First Selected Messages, um, page 256. But you notice the first sentence in the first paragraph in taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. So this is one of those points I was trying to illustrate with you in the previous session about question on doctrine and how there was manipulation about what Ellen White was really saying. The headings tried to make it seem as though Ellen White was saying something that she wasn't. And um, even those that are opposed to last generation theology, such as um, George Knight recognized this as well, and Knight brings this out in his annotated version of the book, Questions on Doctrine. So this is no secret, but we need to be aware of this, and then, you know, kind of raise the questions, so what really are the arguments 
against our historic understanding of the humanity of Christ. So, continuing our questions, what kind of man did God become? Well, he was a sinless man. Clearly, he um, was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, no sin, and had the Holy Spirit present at his birth. But then there are other verses as well. So Romans chapter 1 in verse 3 describes for us that Christ came according to the seed of David and other places, the seed of Abraham. You know, he came into the world with humanity as it was it at that time. Romans 8 in verse 3, very powerful verse. Let's just turn there briefly. Romans 8 in verse 3 where Paul says that Christ, that what, in verse 3, excuse me, for, in verse 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and, and, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So an interesting thought. Paul tells us that Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, some people will say, well, likeness doesn't mean exact likeness. But that would mean that he came in the likeness, but it's really the unlikeness. It doesn't really sound um, foundational as to Paul's using it. Paul uses the same word in he Philippians chapter 2 as he describes Christ in the incarnation being found in the likeness of men. And he's really there trying to underscore the reality of Christ becoming man. So, you know, he says, he doesn't say he came in sinful flesh. He's, he's trying to make some kind of distinction. It's true, because Christ wasn't a sinner. Christ didn't participate in our sin, but he certainly came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And then it's very clear, he condemned sin, where? In the flesh. In other words, when he was tempted, he's condemning sin in the flesh. And then, of course, these famous verses in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 14 and following Hebrews is tremendous book and Hebrews 2 verses 14 and following therefore since the children share in flesh and blood talking about the descendants of Abraham he himself likewise also partook of the same and Andreasen really builds that out in his commentary on the book of Hebrews he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render him Powerless him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And then in verse, um, in verse 17, therefore he had to be made. He was under obligation, really. The Greek kind of brings that out. He was under obligation to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. In, order, in other words, in order to truly be our high priest, he had to enter into our sphere of existence. He had to be made flesh like humanity was. Just like the children share in flesh and blood, he himself also likewise partook of the same. He had to be made in all things like unto his brethren. He's made under the law, made under the curse, as Paul brings out in the book of Galatians. So what kind of man did God become in the incarnation? Well, he became one of us. He entered into the flesh in the world as it was in the world. Now, this is not simply um, uh, a random teaching by uh, some obscure theologians. Karl Barth, who is a well-known uh, theologian, Lutheran theologian, he wrote, there must be no weakening or obscuring of the saving truth that the nature which God assumed in Christ is identical with our nature as we see it in the light of the fall. So this is a really important point, that we should not obscure this key idea that in the incarnation, God assumed, the nature that God assumed in Christ in the incarnation is identical with our nature as we see it in the light of the fall. Really, really very foundational. Well, let's continue in our study. It tells us here, continuing, um, again, this is from Spirit of Prophecy. He knows by experience what are, our, are the weaknesses of humanity, what are our wants, 
And where lies the strength of our temptations? Why? For he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So notice this quotation. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity. What are our wants? Where lies the strength of our temptations? Because he was tempted in all points like as we are. And then she continues, you know, are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Um, are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. Again, beautiful thoughts, but we can have this confidence because we know he came into the temptations, he came to the experience that you and I need to face as well. So let's continue this thought, like what is the purpose for the incarnation? Again, we have the passage that we're already looking at, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 18, where the Apostle Paul tells us that it's essential for Christ to become man, to enter into flesh as it was in the world at that time, for several reasons. First of all, he needs to destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. And we know the devil is defeated through the incarnation. But also, he needs to become a merciful high priest in things pertaining to God. He needs to be able to give aid to those that are tempted. All of this is part of the incarnation, which is directly connected to the kind of humanity Christ assumed in the incarnation. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, tells us that he has come to seek and to save those who are lost. And part of that work of salvation is coming down to where we are. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4 in verses 4 and 5. Galatians 4 in verses 4 and 5, it says, But when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his woman, excuse me, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, or made of a woman, made under the law, for a purpose, verse 5, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Notice the, the causal connection. The purpose of the incarnation is redeeming us. Therefore, Christ must be made of a woman and made under the law. And then in Colossians chapter 1, in verses 19 through 23, a beautiful, beautiful passage, Colossians 1, verses 19 through 23, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him, through Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So this cosmic dimension of reconciliation is also part of the purpose of the Incarnation. It's not just that, this, that we could have salvation, but there are cosmic dimensions to the plan of salvation. And then in verse 21 and following, it describes how we used to be hostile enemies in our mind. Verse 22, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which I have, which was proclaimed in all creation unto heaven, of which I, Paul, am made a minister. So this point here, this cosmic rec reconciliation, but it takes place in his fleshly body at the cross, being put to death at the cross. And so the incarnation is, you know, the key component, clearly key component part to the plan of salvation. And how we view the incarnation impacts other aspects as well. Now, there are Christian groups that believe that Jesus did not come like us, that Jesus really wasn't tempted because it's impossible to tempt God, that he really couldn't have sinned. Now, Seventh-day Adventists historically believe, no, Jesus could have sinned, and that he came to this world with tremendous risk, that all heaven was imperiled as Ellen White says, in the Incarnation. Uh, again, a tremendous thought that everything that was put at risk in the Incarnation. Um, but when we think about the Incarnation, 
Other Christians, other Protestant groups, and even within Adventism, there's a view that Christ could not take a nature like ours, and that's because of sin. The, the thinking goes, in a summary, something like this, that um, if, if Jesus took a fallen nature like ours, if he took sinful nature like we have, fallen human nature, as Ellen White describes it, describes it, if he took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, as Ellen White says in Medical, Medical Ministry on page 181, then the thinking goes that he must necessarily be a sinner because they equate having this fallen nature with sin itself. So uh, let's explore that a little bit. This is from the book Education. In him, in Christ, was found the perfect ideal. To reveal this ideal as the only true standard for attainment, to show what every human being might become, notice that, underscore it, what every human being might become through the indwelling of humanity by divinity. For this, Christ came to the world. Why did he come? He wants to redeem us. He caused this cosmic reconciliation, but also to show what humanity might become through the indwelling of divinity. By having the Holy Spirit dwell in us, Christ came to show what human beings really could be look, what really human beings really could look like. Um, so let's continue through here. Another question, um, then we're going to get back to some of these delicate issues. How long does God remain man? How long is the incarnation continue? Well, a couple of verses that help us with this. First one's Hebrews 7:24, in which Paul is describing Christ's work as our great, great high priest. And he tells us in Hebrews 7, verses 24, that he continues to live. And in verse 25, you know, he's always living to be a priest for us, that his priesthood is eternal, and he carries humanity into that priesthood. And then, of course, Revelation 14, 14, we picture Jesus coming back to this world. The description of him is as the Son of Man. So Jesus has taken our um, humanity, took upon himself in the incarnation, our fallen humanity, was raised with a glorified humanity, and then took that glorified humanity into heaven, still bearing that humanity, a tremendous encouragement, really, on a very personal level for us, knowing that every one of us has a brother in the heavenly courts who has suffered being tempted, and therefore he knows how to give aid to those who are tempted. Desire of Ages, page 329, Ellen White brings this wonderful thought to four, to assure us of his immutable counsel of peace. God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family, forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. My friends, we're listening wherever you are. Do you ever struggle with doubt? We all do. All right, you know, maybe you're struggling with doubt right now. Is God really going to fulfill his word? The pledge that God will fulfill his word is the incarnation that Christ came into this world, was born as a child, yes, through the work of the Holy Spirit, pre-volitional act, pre-incarnational uh, volitional act. He comes into this world, chooses to be born, takes upon himself our fallen nature, lives a holy, spotless, sinless life, ascends into heaven as our elder brother of the human race. This is the pledge that God is going to be faithful to you. So again, in Desire of Ages, page 25, in Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. Now, I've used the expression identity and uniqueness several times in, as we are looking through this aspect of the um, incarnation and the critique of the incarnation by those two books that were our, uh, which are our conversation partners. Identity and uniqueness. And I mentioned this comes from Woodrow Will Woody Whitten. And again, it's a, it's a good expression. I like it that he's unique, but he also identifies with us. But this is a foundation question. And this is a question that cuts to the core. And the question is this, did Jesus partake in our hereditary experience? Did Jesus partake in our hereditary experience? 
Because however sin is transmitted, however we understand sin, um, sin, there has got to be some transmission of sin. And Ellen White brings out this connection with heredity. And so the question is, did Christ partake in our hereditary experience? Or is there something else that happens um, simply because of Adam's fall that's not connected with heredity? That would be a totally new avenue to explore. But this foundational question, did Christ, did Jesus partake in our hereditary experience? Now, some people will answer that question in a qualified way. They will say yes, as far as his hunger and thirst goes, but no, when we talk about his moral worth. Well, Desire of Ages really brings those two together. And I'm not sure we can separate that question out into two parts. So um, in his book, Ellen White on the Humanity of Christ, Witten goes through Ellen White's writings, a very helpful book in many ways, and goes through the, her writings and systematizes them, uh, organizes them by date. Uh, Ralph Larson has done a, a magisterial work along these lines, not just with Ellen White, but with other Adventist authors as well in his book, The Word Made Flesh. Um, but Wooden is really focusing here primarily on Ellen White. And when he comes to The Desire of Ages, which is penned in the 1890s, he writes that The Desire of Ages really contributes nothing original to the discussion on Christ's humanity. In other words, pretty much Ellen White had to say on the humanity of Christ, she said before 1890, before 1888, in, in that realm. Nothing really original there. Now, I'd like to question that assumption because there is something that Desire of Ages seems to be saying that she did not say before this. Well, what is it? Here's the quotation. Desire of Ages, page 48. Like every child of Adam, he, speaking of Christ, accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. Where do we see that? In the history of his earthly ancestors. And then he came with that to share our sorrows, share our temptations, and to give us example of a sinless life life in which there is victory over sin. This is a very important point. You know? Again, as we think through and people try to parse out sin, what's very clear is that Jesus wants to give us an example of a sinless life. And he did it in a human nature impacted with the same heredity that you and I have. Now, there was a, a paper study done, I believe it was an MA thesis, um, by this gentleman by the name of Paul Evans. It's called a historical context analysis of the final generation theology of M.L. Andreasen. And Knight refers to this study uh, many times in his book. He quotes it approvingly in many different places. But it's interesting what Evans also says. Notice this. Um, now for Knight, if uh, for the last generation theology crowd, if there's any difference at all between Christ and us, the whole structure falls apart. So, you know, if there is any, any wiggle room at all, even if you would say, yes, the Holy Spirit, you know, was forming in his birth or something like that, he says, well, then your whole structure collapses. But Evans does not agree with that conclusion. And again, remember, it's Knight who approvingly quotes Evans in several places. And this is what um, he says in his study, this is page 87 of an anal analysis. Apparently, in White's view, the fact that Christ had no taint of sin on him, which we can agree to, does not make him a less suitable pattern for the believer who struggles with temptations adapted to one's moral bias and strong passion. So simply because we should have no misgivings on the perfect sinlessness of the humanity of Christ does not mean that Christ is not a suitable pattern for the believer, that he's not our example, which is what Knight would tend to make us think. So again, this is an exhaustive study looking at um, Ellen White's view and Wagner's view and then delving into M. L. Andreasen's theology. But uh, Evans' conclusion is Ellen White's able to hold both of these concepts together. 
you know, again, as a balance. Remember I mentioned that illustration of a polarity where two sides are both true and important. Christ is unique and he is like us. We should have no misgivings about his sinlessness, about the sinlessness of his spiritual nature, but we should also be very clear that he is impacted by heredity. He came into the world as you and I find ourselves into the world. This is from the book um, by Harry Johnson, Humanity of a Savior. That's his doctoral dissertation a number of years ago. It says, Jesus could assume fallen human nature without becoming a sinner because in all his volitional acts, he was sinless. So again, this is um, uh, his, his viewpoint on uh, Harry Johnson's, sorry, my mind went blank. I started thinking of Harry Anderson, and I knew that wasn't right. Harry Johnson, uh, he, we, Christ could assume fallen nature, and that's the whole argument of his book, that Christ did assume fallen nature, but he's not a sinner because he never engaged in sin as volition. Now, here's another quotation that's very interesting for us. Um, it came out a number of years ago. It's written by Ellen White it's from a letter. And so um, it's not one of her published writings. And then it also has, um, the letter is typed out, and then in the brackets are where she wrote in the letter itself. So it's kind of a question as to what she really meant here, but let's look at this. Coming as he did, as a man, and then there's this inserted phrase, to meet and be subjected to, with all the evil tendencies to which man is heir, working in every conceivable manner to destroy his faith, he made it possible for himself to be buffeted by human agencies inspired by Satan, the rebel who had been expelled from heaven. This is letter 303, 1903. So let's go back. Um, sorry, let's see if I can go back to this. Pardon me. Um, let's look at this quotation again coming as he did as a man. Now, if we took out the words in brackets, it would read, coming as he did as a man with all the evil tendencies to which man is heir. That would be very startling if Ellen White wrote that. So she inserted to meet and be subjected to, but then it really doesn't flow, to meet and be subjected to with. Did she mean to drop out the word with, to meet and be subjected to, all the evil tendencies to which man is heir? Is she saying here, as Witten thinks, that Christ was tempted to the evil temptations, evil tendencies in other people? Or is she trying to say that Christ had that battle in himself as well? The evidence is not 100% conclusive, but it's important here, notice what she's tying it to, heredity even if she's talking about other people. So let's say we, Witten is correct in his assumption that the evil tendencies to which man is heir refers to others. It's important for us to understand that Christ came with a heredity like ours, that there is no break in the heredity. So even if we read it the way Witten suggests we should read it, it still points out to us that Christ came with a heredity like ours which is like this. Now, don't misunderstand me. Um, I'm not saying Christ is exactly like us. That's not my point. But again, we need to be very careful as to how we view the humanity of Christ. I'm not saying that Christ had passions of evil men. Uh, that's not my point at all. But the connection with heredity and what we receive as heredity is the connecting point to Christ's humanity. So, <clears throat> Let's continue here and kind of transition in our last bit of time together to a few other points. Um, one of the major critiques, again, of last generation theology is this idea that God's people participate in somehow vindicating God. And so Wooden asks this question in his document, uh, Questions on Doctrine, what should be the enduring theological legacy? Again, you can download this um, on the website from Andrews University from the symposium they had in 2007 on questions on doctrine. So <clears throat> he asked the question in this document, is there not solid Bible and Ellen, Ellen White evidence for the claim that Christ fully vindicated God's demand for perfect obedience by his own life and work? And to, ask, to answer that question, 
I would say unequivocally, unanimously, yes. There is solid Bible and Ellen White evidence for the claim that Christ fully vindicated God's demand for perfect obedience. Clearly, Jesus did do that at the cross. But the second question needs to be asked. Is there not solid Bible and, Spirit and Ellen White evidence for the claim that the church participates in God's vindication by allowing Christ to dwell in them? So again, what Witten wants to do is he wants to cut in half a polarity that really needs to be joined together. He wants to separate this out. He wants to only focus on one side where really what's important is both sides of the concept that Christ fully vindicated the Father. Christ cried out, it is finished, the battle is won, Satan is defeated, very true. But the war still goes on. Satan has come down to this earth knowing he has but a short time, and he's continuing the war. And there is Bible and Ellen White evidence to show that the church, you and I, we participate in God's vindication. And this quotation is from um, Wagner and from the General Conference Bulletin, 1897, I believe it's Wagner. Um, <clears throat> it says, but God has left the vindication of his character to his children. He has, as it were, risked his character with men. Uh, I might be mistaken, this might be Jones, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Wagner, my apologies. But God has left the vindication of his character with children. He has, as it were, risked his character with men. Yes, now this is from Wagner. This is a quotation from Wagner that uh, Witten refers to in his article in the book, God's Character. And so Witten's response is that God is viewed as almost totally dependent upon human beings to vindicate himself. And this is from God's Character, page 27. But if you continue reading there, the you know, original context of the quotation. So the previous quotation says that God has left the vindication of his character to his children. And then the accusation is, it looks like God is dependent on human beings to vindicate him and that somehow human beings have enough power to be involved in this vindication. But the quotation that directly follows from that first quote is this. It's from Romans. Yea, let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might be justified in your sayings, and might overcome when thou art judged. And then there's this long quotation. Again, this is Romans chapters 3, and it's talking about how we're all sinners, and we've all fallen short. And the entire rest of the section goes on talking about how much we are sinners. So, in direct opposition, again, I, I would say respectfully uh, that this is kind of a straw man argument to say that last generation theology proponents are teaching vindication, uh, that God's people participate in the vindication, and that somehow this removes the glory from God. And that this is a gross misunderstanding of what's really being presented. And let's continue with this thought. <clears throat> Uh, continued quotation, the character of God and the justice of his dealings with his creatures are on trial before the universe. The rebellion of Satan is based on his assertion that God is unjust and that his government of system of government is faulty. Again, this is from Wagner, Present Truth, December 14, 1893. When we obey God and when we exercise faith and claim his promised power to enable us to do his will, we testify that sin is without excuse, that every provision is made for the welfare and happiness of his creatures. So notice the dynamics here. When we obey God and we exercise faith and we claim the power to follow his will. Really the whole emphasis here, both in Wagner and in Douglas and in um, Andreasen, is on this cooperative aspect with God's work and humanity. This is from the Sanctuary Service, Andreasen's book. It is in the last generation of men living on the earth that God's power unto sanctification will stand fully revealed. So there's this thought that in the last generation, they have an experience, they go through something very different than other people have had. Sanctif Sanctuary Service continues. The demonstration of that power is God's vindication. So. What power are we talking about? 
back on this quote, the last generation of men on earth that God's power unto sanctification will stand fully revealed. Whose power is it? Why, it's God's power. It's God's activity. The demonstration of that power is God's vindication. Whose power? God's power. So it's, in a sense, it's a self-vindication, but it happens with the cooperative aspect of God's people. It clears him of all charges which Satan has placed against him. Now, I mentioned this passage to you in our previous study, Revelation chapter 12. It's one of the hymns in Revelation. It's talking about the fall of Satan. Satan's being cast out of heaven. Michael defeats Satan in, in the battle. And then there's this ongoing fall. You know, he falls and then he's cast out. And there's a, a series, a successive series of falls in the book of Revelation, culminating with Satan being thrown into the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 20. But in this passage, there is this hymn section. There's a loud voice in heaven, and they recognize the victory is God. Salvation, power, kingdom, authority belong to our God. And then there is the reason for the celebration, um, because Satan is thrown down. Satan is thrown down. And then the passage goes on to say, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, that's anchored into the death of Christ, and by the word of their testimony, that is, they did not love their life, even when faced with death. So God's people anchor in the death of Christ, but also recognize that um, they have a participatory aspect and they overcame, they overcome the way Christ overcame through self-denial and self-sacrifice. Here's a quotation from Ellen White, Bible Echo, January 1st, 1888. It becomes every child of God to vindicate his character. You can magnify the Lord. You can show the power of sustaining grace. Desire of Ages, 171. <clears throat> the honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. So the honor of God, the honor of Christ, involved in the perfection of the character of his people. This is not perfectionism. This is not self-glorification. Great Controversy 670, the working out of Satan's rule in contrast with the government of God has been presented to the whole universe. God's wisdom, his justice, and his goodness stand fully vindicated. This is at the end of the thousand years. So yes, Bible and Ellen White evidence that Christ vindicated the Father. But also yes, Bible and Ellen White evidence that vindication is something we participate in. And that vindication is not fully completed until the end of the thousand years. So participating in vindicating God's character really shouldn't be a stumbling block. It's really part of our understanding of um, our eschatology and the great controversy theme as well. One more point on this. In the Bible commentary, um, <clears throat> commenting, commenting on the Hebrew word sadak in relation to, in the book of Daniel, um, it says that Sadak may convey the additional thought that God's character will be vindicated as the climax to the hour of judgment, which began in 1844. So even the Bible commentary in its work indicates this thought of vindication. This is not some uh, heretical idea that's being imported unless it's being misrepresented, unless there's a straw man issue here in which somebody's saying we vindicate God by our own efforts. That would be heresy. But to say that God's power is manifest in the final generation and that they reflect the image of Jesus fully, that they reject all temptations of the devil and they are fully united with Christ, that is not a heresy. That is simple Bible truth. So um, just as we draw to a close, perfection is a really important issue here, but Ellen White also addressed it. I just want to end with this thought from the book Fork in the Road by Herbert Douglas. Perfection refers to the pattern of life, excuse me, refers to the life pattern of those who increasingly reflect the life of Jesus. What's perfection from a biblical stance? Perfection is growing day by day, more and more, into the likeness of Jesus Christ, becoming more like him. It's this 
growing, this maturing. And in fact, we find something very similar in the book, God's Character. If any believer is growing in grace, advancing in union with Christ, he or she can be declared perfect. And I don't think anyone would argue with that question on perfection. Now, the misuse, the straw man is perfectionism, where we think by our own efforts, we can change some level of holiness with which we do not need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. The important point for us is, as we looked in our last presentation, that we will never get to the point beyond which we need the justifying and sanctifying effect of Christ's righteousness. It is needful to us 100% of the time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. We pray that we would have clarity in mind and understanding some of these deep issues that we might truly reflect Jesus' character. Lord, we long to live to see him come. May we be with him on that day. In Jesus' name, amen.